Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We are following up with this new series that we started last week. And remember that we are in the process of making use of everything that I personally have ever learned just from studying the scriptures. Things like how to understand Bible typology, uh, understanding the numbers that are given and what they mean. Numbers like number 12, number 40, which is based on four. Uh, other numbers that I think will be relevant in this study. Um, the use of the language structure that is only found in one Bible in the entire world, and that is our beloved King James Bible. It just seems like it falls perfectly in line with what Isaiah said, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read, No one of these shall fail, and none shall want her mate. So if you're reading a verse from one place in the Bible, and it, and it just doesn't seem to you know, gel, or you can't quite understand what it means. <clears throat> you read another place in the Bible, and all of a sudden it just seems like they fit together like pieces in a puzzle. No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. And it will answer questions that you may have had all your life about certain passages in the Bible that before didn't make sense, now they make sense. And now, even though it may be something that to a lot of people who call themselves Christians, and, and I wouldn't be their judge, I believe a, a lot of people are, even if they don't agree with me on what I'm saying, even if you don't agree with me on what I'm saying, I'm not sure I agree with me on what I'm saying, but I'm trying to follow the clues of the Bible uh, the way you are. Even, even if no one has ever thought of this before, there's a lot of things that we're finding now in our Bible that a hundred years ago didn't make sense. Now, I've mentioned this before. For instance, Psalm 139, 16. In thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Now, to my knowledge, no one a hundred years ago ever put that verse in the context of DNA. And yet we know now for a fact, for a fact, that at the moment of conception, a book is written out of every member of that whether it's a human baby, an animal baby, a goldfish baby, a plant baby, or whatever kind of baby it is. At that moment of conception, every member of the body of that living organism is written out perfectly in its DNA, its book. Even though those pieces or those members of that body haven't been fashioned yet, they are continuously fashioned when as yet there was none of them. And when you take what we know about DNA and apply it to that verse, you go, there it is. And our wonderful Bible-believing people that died for believing the Bible believed Psalm 139 the way they understood it they just couldn't see it because science hadn't caught up yet. And yet there it is. So I have to look at the Bible, not just from the perspective of all of my forefathers who were in the faith, the way they understood it, but I also have to understand it the way it is written. Remember, this Bible is a book of present truth. So I have to see the Bible 
in the fact that it is not only written for all generations in the past, it is written for my generation right now. The things that we understand about the world around us, the universe, and how things work, and so on, this Bible is still right. And the more we find out about everything that goes on around us, the more we find out that those things have been in this Bible all along. So we use the tools of Bible typology, Bible prophecy, the prophets, the way they speak. God speaketh once, yea, twice, in a dream and a vision. So as Isaiah spoke, and a fulfillment took place in the days of Christ, like in Isaiah, it said he was numbered with the transgressors. Well, we have a place there in the Gospels where certainly he was numbered with the transgressors. But there's more in those passages that have not been fulfilled yet. Things like Joel chapter 2. Some of those events have not happened yet. Isaiah, uh, I think it's Isaiah 61, where Jesus took was given the book there in the synagogue, and he read from the book of Isaiah. It was Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord has sent me to preach deliverance to the captives and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book mid-sentence gave it back uh, to the man and said, this day is this prophecy fulfilled in your ears. But there's more prophecies, even in that same sentence, there's more prophecies that weren't fulfilled at that time. They will be fulfilled later in a perfect time. We're going to look at things like that. Uh, the numbers, the typology, the prophecies, the language structure of the Bibles, Maybe even a few colors we might throw in there, okay? But our understanding of the Bible, not just what our forefathers understood, but what we can see now in the world around us, I think gives us, uh, I don't want to say a better understanding of Scripture. They understood it as best as they could in the day that they lived in but an understanding that fits the times that we are living in. So remember the two questions that I brought up last week that we were going to be looking at in, in this series that I'm calling Taken. Taken as in kidnapped, removed from their home, and taken someplace else. Where is it they're going to be taken? Here's the verses our two questions come from. Deuteronomy 28, verse 49, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far. How far are they coming from? F from the end of the earth. Well, we talked about that last week, the Carmen line. There is an end of the earth. From the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. And, and let me stop right here. When this was written, there was no flying Jews. Okay? There were no flying Jews. He didn't say as swift as the leopard runneth. He said as swift as the eagle now, there may have been some fast-running Jews, you know, running from Babylonian soldiers. But there were no flying Jews back then. Do we have flying Jews now? Well, El Al, okay? The Jewish, the Jewish airline. But as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance. That means they look mean all the time, like that. A nation which shall not regard the person of the old nor show favor to the young. And then Jeremiah 5.15, Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation. This nation goes back way back to the beginning. There's a TV show called 
They should have called it ancient nations, but they didn't. They called it ancient something else. What did they call it? An ancient nation, a nation whose tongue thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. So question number one is, what in the world kind of nation exists where no one knows what they're saying? No one's ever figured out their language. No one has ever understood their speech. It's never happened, not happening now, and it never will happen. What nation is that? Number one. Number two, Deuteronomy 29. The Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is the as it is this day, and then he says in chapter 30 where that land is. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. The outmost parts, not of the earth, the outmost parts of heaven. And remember, there are three heavens. We'll look at that in a minute. But that's the two questions. What nation is this of fierce countenance who can fly faster than an eagle whose tongue nobody has ever understood and ever will understand. And why is it that they don't live on this planet, Earth? Why is it that obviously they come from the outmost part of heaven and they took the Jews captivity to that same place, to the outmost part of heaven. I know it sounds bizarre. I, I get it. I know it's, and I, I tried every way in the world to not make this series. And it just seemed like God wouldn't let up. Matthew chapter 24, I won't read all of this for time's sake, I want to move on. But remember in verse 31, this is when the Lord appears in the clouds, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now in Mark 13, he adds two places earth and heaven. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. The uttermost, which means the farthest place in heaven that is possible God's angels are going to gather them together and bring them together once again. Both those who are on the earth and those who have been scattered to the outermost part of heaven. Now, last week, I showed you uh, this graphic of what we believe the Bible is teaching us about the different heavens. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 12, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. So we have the first heaven, which is the at atmosphere, the sky above the trees, where the clouds are, where the birds fly, and where there are clouds. Then we have the second heaven, 
which also counts as part of the heaven. We have that heaven, which is the expanse of the firmament, which is where all of the stars, all of the galaxies, all of the quasars, all of the um, all comets, all of the, the heavenly things that we have seen with our telescopes, that's the second heaven exi existing above the first heaven. Remember, there's the Kármán line where the end of the atmosphere is, and above that, there's no more atmosphere. So we have the second heaven, and then we have what he calls here the third heaven, what the Bible says, and we'll get to those, what the Bible says in other places as the heaven of heavens. The heavens part is the sky and the second heaven, outer space. Even they have a heaven above them, which is the abode of God. It is where heavenly Jerusalem is, Jerusalem above, which is free, Paul says in Galatians 4, which is the mother of us all. It is where the temple of God is. It is where God's throne is, where the Ark of the Covenant is. It is the realm of where all the angels, the angelic priesthood of Melchizedek, it is where they serve God in the temple of God. That is in the third heaven, which is so far away from this earth right now that we cannot even, we can't even see it. Every time we build a new and bigger telescope, and whether we put it on the highest mountain on earth or we put it uh, above the atmosphere like the Hubble telescope in space or the James Webb telescope that we just put up or uh, it seems like I heard that the Chinese have a telescope on the moon. Wouldn't surprise me a bit. I don't know why we don't have a telescope on the moon. Maybe we do have one on the moon, but maybe it's not watching out for things in space. Maybe it's watching the Chinese and the Russians and whoever. Wouldn't surprise me a bit. But it doesn't matter. The, the biggest, farthest telescope that we have, we can see 13 billion light years away, 15 billion light years away, even beyond that. And they tell us that the universe is only 13 billion years old. And yet, this is what's always never really made sense to me. If light is coming from 13 billion light years away, meaning according to them, the evil evolutionary scientists, the ones who don't believe that God created everything in six days, 6,000 years ago, they say that the light from a star 13 billion light years away, that that star's light shined on us or toward us 13 billion years ago, and it took 13 billion years for its light to reach Earth. Okay? But then they say the Big Bang happened 13 billion years ago. Now, when we look out at these stars and galaxies that are 13 billion light years away, we don't see shapeless masses all floating around in willy-nilly ways. In other words, we don't see chaos. When we look at a, a distant entity, 13 billion light years from us, we see it perfectly formed, just like we see all the other stars of the heavens formed. Why don't we see the chaos of the original Big Bang from 13 billion. You understand what I'm saying? We should be seeing, if it took 13 billion years to get to us, we should be seeing the birth of the universe, but we don't. We know for a fact that 
with as far as we can see, we can still detect specks of light even farther than that, which tells us that there are galaxies and stars that are even farther out there than we can see, that are perfectly formed. There is no telling how far away the third heaven is from us. But God said that there are going to be people who are scattered to the outmost part of the heaven. Mm. That is one long trip. Unless you could figure out how, and we know God can. They say in order for, let's say, a, a planet 10 billion light years away, and the creatures on that planet wanted to visit Earth. Well, they could take a 10 billion light a year long trip. That's a waste. Or they could figure out some way of, let's say here's Earth. And here is a planet 10 billion light years away. You could travel 10 billion years to get to Earth, or you figure out some way of folding space so that it only takes a few minutes to get to the Earth. Do you know the Bible says that when God comes down, he bows the heaven? In other words, he literally folds like a mantle the heavens, so that this planet that used to be 13 billion light years away now is our next door neighbor. Reminds me of the mantle that Elijah folded when he divided the Jordan River and the same one that Elisha folded to divide the Jordan River as well. Oh, I got a head full of stuff here I could ramble on about, but let's get back. Let's get back to our notes where we left off. Okay, so you see the, the three heavens. You see the sky above us, outer space, and then the third heaven where heavenly Jerusalem is. All right. And, and we started out talking about this number four, how it represented number one, the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, uh, Jesus said in Acts that the disciples were to take the gospel in Acts chapter 1, uh, first in Judea, then uh, Jerusalem first, then Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. The gospel was to go to four places, four gospels, the story of Christ, death, burial, and resurrection to four places on the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. In Revelation chapter uh, seven, we see the two groups. We see the Jews, the 112,000 from each tribe, 144,000 sealed with the seal of God in their forehead. And then we see also another group in verse 9. After this, and beheld a low, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues. Well, what did the um, nations, kindreds, people, and tongues, how did they get to the throne of God? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They got there by way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, that's how you, that's how you find this stuff. Find things that are listed as four. And you're either going to be dealing with the real gospel or you're going to be dealing with a false gospel. And so last week, that's what we sort of were leaving off with. Paul mentioned this four times in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, another gospel. Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 6, another gospel, then any other gospel, 
and then again any other gospel. Four times Paul warned us about any other gospel. So it's going to be associated with the exact same number. Now something that is always stuck in my mind, and this would be based upon Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Solomon saying, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. That's an interesting point. If the rivers run into the sea, how come the sea is not rising up? Well, it's because the waters are taken out of the sea by way of sun and wind, which are both pictures of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Sun and wind pick the water up out of the sea, take it up into the upper atmosphere. It condenses as clouds. When the cl clouds get enough water built into them and when the atmospheric conditions are just right when a, a low pressure sister comes in system comes in then all that rain drops down over the land which when it does it runs into streams which runs into creeks which runs into rivers which in this area flows all the rivers from the eastern part of the rocky mountains to the uh, western part of the appalachians they Every one of them run into the Mississippi River. Mississippi River is a mighty, mighty river. And it's just right over here. My dad worked on it for years. I used to love, the, I still do love going to the river. But that river runs down into the Gulf of Mexico. And that Gulf of Mexico water does exactly what? It's warm water down there. So it's constantly being heated, brought back up into the clouds, brought back over the United States flushes down into the creeks, the streams, the rivers, to the Mississippi, right back down to the Gulf of Mexico, and it does it about every 90 days. Water, water that starts in the rivers, any, at any given place, 90 days later, that same water molecule is going to find itself back in the Mississippi River again. Isn't that beautiful? So the, what he's telling you is the thing that, that's history. The thing that hath been is the same that thing that shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. And it caught, caught my attention that Paul said in here, when he mentioned the other gospel and who would bring it, he said this in verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. So I started thinking about that. Has that already happened throughout history? Yes. Let's go to the first place that an angel from heaven <clears throat> brought another gospel to this world. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. She already had God's word given to her. And then it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Number one, he's promising her a part of the gospel that we believe in, eternal life. And then he says, for God doth know. Now he's saying that God had a, God had a secret that he didn't tell you. I'm going to tell you. And you know, manly guys like Manly Hall, Albert Pike, Robert Mackey, all of these Masonic authors, they all give credit to Lucifer for being the one to bring the fire of the gods down to mankind in the form of this other gospel. God said 
if you, you can have the whole garden. You can have the tree of life. In other words, tree of life, live forever. You'll never die. That's the gospel. But then Satan brings another gospel. An angel from heaven brings another gospel. And he says, disobey God. Not only will you not die, but you'll be elevated to the status like us gods. You'll know everything then. You'll know the secret that God doesn't want to tell you. And nations around the world have worshipped serpents, dragons, four-footed creatures, beasts, creeping things. In fact, Romans, I love this Bible. This Bible makes it so easy for me to just preach and preach and preach for hours and hours and hours and hours on end without even breaking a sweat. Professing themselves, this is Romans 1, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like, like, made like to corruptible man and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. False gospel. And who brought that? An angel from heaven, the serpent. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So we have an angel from heaven preaching another gospel, and mankind fell for it. Historically, we have that same thing happening. 1.2 billion people, at least, on a planet of 7.33 billion people, something like that, Believe the religion of Roman Catholicism. And how did Roman Catholicism have its start? Well, take a look at this early painting. We don't have a photograph of it. But it's Constantine, the emperor of Rome, who claims to see some sort of angelic sign in heaven. Now, some say it was a cross. Some say that it was the Cairo symbol. Chi is the Greek letter that, and it looks like an X. And it's usually CH. The Rho is a Greek letter that looks like a letter P. But it, if you just add one little line there, it becomes the letter R. Okay, but in Greek, the what looks like a letter P is an R. So the Cairo symbol is the letter R without the little dangle on it, standing inside the letter X, the Cairo. And they want you to think that it's the first two letters of the name Christos or Christ, Jesus Christ. And so Constantine's fighting a battle and he sees this angelic visitation in the heaven drawing for him some sort of sign that kind of looked like a cross, whether it was a cross or the Cairo symbol that you see here. And underneath it, the words, in hoc senio vinces, which means in this sign, conquer. So Constantine took that to mean that he was to become a Christian or at least be tolerant now to Christians. And instead of slaying all of them, let's, let's take all of the Christians 
and let's put them under Roman rule. We'll let them be Christians, but we'll give them a church to belong to. The Roman church. And over the years, in this sign conquer, and especially nowadays, when you don't hear of the Catholic Inquisitions taking people who are Baptist and, you know, stretching their body so bad that they fall all to pieces. You don't hear about the Catholic Inquisitions where Christians are burned in the, in the center of the city at, at the stake. You don't have things like that anymore. They've conquered them in a much different way. They've conquered them with false doctrine, false teachers. They've infiltrated colleges. They, they infiltrated the New Testament Greek committee. Since the 80s, there has been a Catholic priest on the committee that determines what the New Testament Greek is going to say. And there's still one on there today. So they've brought in a new gospel through the Roman Catholic system. And for hundreds of years, Baptists and other Protestant churches stood against your Roman popery. You ought to read, if you, if you find a King James, you can find this on Wikipedia. You ought to read the, the epistle of, from the translators to the reader that still exists in some publications of the King James Bible. But if it's not in your Bible, then look it up online. You know, they mention popery several times. And the word popery doesn't mean, you know, like boiling smelly things in a little pot and putting nice, beautiful scents in your house. Popery means the papacy. And those who worked the, to translate the King James Bible hated the papacy. They hated them. And they knew that the papacy had been, was still, and would forever continue to eliminate the translation that those men had worked seven years on. They knew that the number one enemy to the authorized Bible of 1611 was the papacy. They knew it. That was their enemy. And so Constantine sees angelic signs in the heavens and delivers a new gospel to the world, a gospel that, that depends upon the priests and the Pope and now Mary to forgive your sins. The church grants salvation, not God. And if you don't do what the church tells you to do, then you are not saved. You see, this Bible's right. Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, bring you any other gospel. Let him be accursed. And Paul knew exactly what he was talking about. What about this guy, Joseph Smith? How did he come up with his religion? According to him, an angel from heaven came named Moroni. Now, we have no ain't such angel mentioned anywhere in the scriptures. And yet, Joseph Smith meets an angel named Moroni who shows him the, lo the secret location of these golden plates written in reformed hieroglyphics, which nobody had ever heard of before. Nobody had ever seen them Nobody knew what they said. Nobody. Joseph Smith puts on these seer glasses called the Urim and the Thummim 
and he, he is able to look then at the golden plates with these seer glasses and translate the reformed hieroglyphics and he he reads it out to somebody who's writing it. That's supposedly how it all went down. Now, I have no idea if it happened that way or not. I wasn't there. But clearly, this angel from heaven delivered to Joseph Smith a book called The Book of Mormon or Another Testament of Jesus Christ. Hence, another gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody, and there's just, I, I don't, I'm not angry at them for sending me this song because they just really hadn't thought about it and they didn't know better. But somebody several years ago sent me a song that they heard on the internet it was on YouTube and they just loved the song. It was a pretty, and I, it was a pretty song. But in its words, it mentioned something about the gospel that thou hast restored. Well, I know what that means. That's Mormon talk. See, Joseph Smith was told by God that the real gospel that he gave through Jesus Christ and the apostles, the church messed it all up. They ruined the whole thing. And so God was going to give it to Joseph Smith to restore the true and original gospel. And what was, here's where we're going now. What was that a true and original gospel according to Joseph Smith, the angel Moroni, and the leadership of the Mormon church was that God, Elohim, came from a planet way out, way out at the uttermost part of the heaven, a planet called Kolob. They even have a, a hymn written. Would you hie to Kolob? High is an old word that means would you, wouldst thou hurry up and get to Kolob? Would you hie to Kolob? Because according to Mormons, God, our God, Elohim, lived as a man on a planet named Kolob married a bunch of wives. When they died, they ascended into the celestial plane, was given a planet of their own to rule over. And that planet happened to be planet Earth. And that Elohim, through his various wives, fathered several children, one of which was named Jesus Christ, the other was named Lucifer. Yes, they were brothers. And of course, when it came time to father Jesus Christ here on this earth, then Elohim came down to Mary's house and slept with her. Of course, now she's no longer a virgin. That breaks the prophecy of Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. But the idea that their God came from a different planet, to me, is extremely interesting in the world that we live in right now. In fact, their saying is, as man is, God once was when he was on Kolob. And as God is, man will be. Do you know the divorce rate in Utah, which is at least 75% Mormon people who live in Utah, 
Most members of Congress are Mormons. Most of the town's mayors, most of the people elected to public places, they're all Mormons. It is a Mormon state. And yet the divorce rate is higher in Utah than it is any other state in the union. You know why? Because if you are a Mormon, a good Mormon young man, and you marry a young lady and she no longer wishes to be Mormon any longer, you get rid of her, Jack, because she'll keep you from being a god over your own planet and having celestial angel babies who will then populate a planet of your own. You see how it works? In fact, if you want to see Mormon doctrine in a, a show or a play or anything like that, there's, the, the, there's a play called, Broadway play called The Book of Mormon. I haven't seen it. But I think for those of you who don't like musicals and like science fiction, then watch Battlestar Galactica. Both, both versions, the 70s version and the, um, what was it, the 2000s version, both were pretty good. But Glenn Larson, the man who came up with the original Battlestar Galactica, was a Mormon. And he wrote Battlestar Galactica as basically the story of how the Earth God populated. It was from people from a planet called, not Kolob, Kobol. They just changed the letters around a little bit. And here you have Captain, remember, you remember Lauren Green from the original one? He was Captain Adama, Adam, the first Adam. You had other people, characters named Apollo. These are all gods, okay? Um, what was the other guy, the coffee place, Starbuck, Starbuck, okay, and Captain Adama sits with a council of 12, are you getting that, the council of 12, like the 12 tribes, the 12 disciples, the 12 constellations, the 12 months, 12 hours in the day, 12 hours in the night. All of this relate to when God created the, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the heavenly bodies. He, he made them for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. So this is where my idea of the number 12 keeps going back to. I'm tweaking it a little bit. It's not just the number four God's promise fulfilled. It has to do with the heavens. And here you have Adama with his 12 disciples as a council that rule over. They've left the planet Kolob or Kobol and they're in, they're looking for a planet to rule over called Earth so they can populate it grow people on it, and those people can ascend into the heavens to become gods themselves over other planets. They even have, remember the Cylons from, from both shows, the, the uh, early, late 70s, early 80s version, and then the, the newer one on the sci-fi channel. The Cylons were these uh, in some cases, in the old show, they were all robots. In the new show, they were human robots. In some cases, almost impossible to detect from real human beings. Cybertronic humans. Ruled over by this guy here, who they called Lucifer. And I remember watching this show and I'm going, they got a devil. The devil's on that show, which is what got me interested. And then I heard a preacher, I think it was Preacher Golf, who said Battlescar Galactica was written by Mormons. And I'm going, no way. Sure enough, 
It was. Though we or an angel from heaven bring you any... And see how their gospel is taught? Even if you're not a Mormon, how many sci-fi fans remember Battlestar Galactica? Both versions of it. I'm not a Mormon, but boy, that was a neat show. Because that was right after Star, Star Wars started all that. And so I guess the executives, I, I don't, can't remember if it was ABC or whatever, they said, we need something like that as a show on television. And Glenn Larson said, what, have I got a script for you? And they just, they ran with it. But it's teaching mankind this other gospel that what would happen if us on earth were visited by peoples from another planet who came down in peace and told us about where, what civilization they came from and what planet they came from and look at our technology that we have and on and on and on and on. Okay? That's Mormon doctrine brought by another angel. Then, of course, we have Finnis Dake. And see, these, these guys are all coming up basically with the same idea. In case you don't know Finnis Dake, I didn't know Finnis Dake until somebody, a young man that I was trying to train for the ministry here, decided to turn against me and our doctrine and went after the doctrine of Finnis Dake. If you've ever seen a Dake's annotated reference Bible, don't buy it. There is a book that Dake wrote called God's Plan for Man. Well, let's see here. Another guy named Charles Taves Russell wrote a book called God's plan for man. Another guy by the name of uh, Clarence Larkin wrote a book called God's plan for man, dispensational truth. And by the way, Dake and Charles Taze Russell and Clarence Larkin were all dispensationalists, all of them. And they pretty much all had the same, the exact same charts. Okay, and if you don't if you don't believe what I'm saying about Clarence Larkin, look up his tombstone. That's all I'll tell you. Just go to Google and type in Clarence Larkin's tombstone. You tell me what you think. Okay, but here's Finnis Dake. Finnis Dake. They called him the Living Bible. Because he said that he didn't actually read and memorize the whole Bible. He said God downloaded the whole Bible into his brain. And he could quote just any verse in the world. He could quote whole chapters, boom, 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 just like that. And again, it wasn't through study like we're told to do. Study to show thyself approved unto God. He said... God let him cheat and downloaded the whole thing, the whole Bible into his brain. And so, according to him, he now is the supremo expert of everything God. And guess what? And by the way, to, to, to say that Finnis Dake had an influence on modern Christianity is an understatement. How many charismatic churches are there in this world? How many Pentecostal churches are there in this world? And I wouldn't put all Pentecostals in the same bunch. I wouldn't. There are some good ones out there. And I want you to know that I, 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 don't, I don't want to offend those who are following Scripture. Okay? But Dake was nuts. I've read Dake. Because I had to deal with it here. And I wanted to know what I was dealing with here. And while I was gone to Kenya, 
leaving a young man that I trusted to fill in my pulpit for me, the very first lesson he taught after I got on a plane was this statement right here by Finnis Dake. Finnis Dake said, God lives in a mansion on a material planet called heaven and is invisible to us only because he is so far away that we cannot see him. And humans are miniatures of God in attributes and power. By the way, here's Finnis Dake on a talk show with a very, very young Jimmy Baker. There you see a picture of Finnis Dake standing in, in front of his, one of his big dispensational charts. You know, those big charts that they say, this is how God's going to do everything. They got it all figured out, right? And yet Dake tells everybody that God lives on a material, it means made of this stuff, planet called heaven. So what does that mean? It means that according to Dake, when Jesus comes back, he's coming back from a planet to take us to be with him on his home planet. You get where I'm going? Do you, you see what I'm trying to tie together for you? When God told the Jews, though you are at the outmost part of the heaven, thence will I bring you. When he says, he shall send his angels from the four corners to gather together those who are in one end of heaven to the other. Dake, like the Mormons, is telling everybody, and Dake is the grandfather all the charismatic churches. And let me tell you something. Charismatic churches are not small churches. They're huge in many places. And they're everywhere. So Dake's Jesus is not coming from the third heaven. The heaven of heavens. He's coming from a planet to take those of us, his charismatic saints, to a planet home in space. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like a setup. Big setup. To get people to believe that if some heavenly, bright, angelic, Christ-looking being ascends down from the sky and says, come all of you who want to come with me to my home in heaven. Come visit my beautiful home that I come from. It's the planet Zigzag. And it's beautiful. It's heaven itself. People are going to do it, aren't they? Because fruitcakes like Finnis Dake. Then you have Ellen White. Take a look at this picture here of it, that, she, that she had drawn sort of to describe her doctrine of how things work. See that all-seeing eye there? Where did she get that from? She didn't get it from the Bible. She didn't get it 
Looks very Masonic, doesn't it? In fact, let's, let's take that all-seeing eye and let's connect it with this all-seeing eye, which says, Anuit coeptus novus ordo seclorum. Now, I did a whole series on this, right? And I didn't know then what I know now. But let's take that phrase, Anuit coeptus novus ordo seclorum, and let's, let's see if we can figure out what it means. It means he favors the birth coeptus novus means new ordo seclorum a new world order now remember the Mormons say that our God lives on planet Kolob and Jesus is coming back from planet Kolob to take his saints back to a new world. Finnis Dake says that God lives on a material planet called heaven. So apparently when Jesus leaves heaven, which is a material planet, and comes back and says, who wants to go with me up into heaven? And they all go, we do, we do, we do. Is he taking them to Jerusalem above, which is free? No, he's taking them to a material planet. So now Ellen White, with the all-seeing eye, favoring a new world order. A new government on this earth that didn't origi originate from this old world. It's a new world. A world that nobody's ever been to. Remember what they called the Americas? The New World. Why? Because nobody from Europe had ever been here. Even though millions of people lived already in North and South America, they assumed that those people didn't really exist or that they had no right being there because we come representing the Pope. Here's our crucifix or whatever. And they just took over. Okay? But they called it the New World. So, are there any more new worlds on this planet to conquer? No. So, just maybe, I'm just spitballing here, just thinking out loud. Maybe the new world order that comes is coming about not from anything on this earth. We've already tried everything. Maybe it's from a new world that we don't know about. By the way, here's Ellen White's new gospel that she got from an angel. Her own words, <clears throat> Ellen White said, I saw an angel flying swiftly to me. He quickly carried me from the earth to the holy city. It, do you really think she went to heaven? I don't either. In the city I saw a temple which I entered. I passed through a door before I came to the first veil. This veil was raised and I passed into the holy place. Here I saw the altar of incense, the candlestick with seven lamps, and the table on which was the showbread. After viewing the glory of the holy, Jesus raised the second veil, and I passed into the holy of holies. Now, I just want to ask you, and you can think of me whatever you want to, but anywhere in the Bible, did you ever see a woman going into 
the most holy place. Uh -uh. Which is where she saw, quote, tables of stone which folded together like a book. That's a lie. Jesus opened them and I saw the Ten Commandments written on them with the finger of God. On one table were four and on the other six. The four on the first table shone brighter than the other six, but the fourth, the Sabbath commandment, shone above them all. The fourth. Remember what the gospel represents and the false gospel represents? It's represented by the number four. So she says the fourth, the Sabbath commandment, shone above them all. For the Sabbath was set apart to be kept in honor of God's holy name. The holy Sabbath looked glorious. A halo of glory was all around it. I saw that the Sabbath commandment was not nailed to the cross. Where did she get that from? She used a quote that Paul made in Colossians concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ and directly contradicted it. Because Paul said in Colossians 2, 14 and 15, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross and having spoiled principalities and powers he made a shoe of them openly triumphing over them in it paul said the gospel is based upon the fact that christ took the 10 ordinances that were against us and nailed them to his cross ellen white said this angel showed her that the fourth commandment was not nailed to the cross. Who's lying? Who's lying? And those of you who live in Kenya, and you go to a Seventh-day Adventist church, or you pastor a Seventh-day Adventist church, and you're angry at me for quoting Ellen White, saying I'm spreading lies about her, that's her own words. And yet she directly contradicts the gospel of Jesus Christ by saying that Christ did not nail all of the commandments to the cross, thus saving us from the curse of sin, that he left one of them unnailed, which was the Sabbath commandment, and that we have to obey it or we're all going to hell. The bottom line is this. There's a false gospel coming. And I was, when I started piecing all of this together, it just dawned on me. How many of these angelic visitations that came to mankind that were trying to convince mankind that a, a gospel, a good news, a, a new world could be built if we can get man to go to such and such planet and we would enjoy heaven itself with these other beings. That's a setup. And see, in the world that we live now, you, if you start doing some research, you're going to start finding out that all of that stuff you heard on Star Trek about warp drive and, you know, folding space, the space-time continuum and all that stuff that sounded like thousands of years ahead of us, you're going to find out that we're actually closer to that than you realize. 
Elon Musk knows it. Jeff Bezos knows it. The guys with the money. And since they know it, um, Robert Bigelow, the hotel billionaire who now has NASA contracts coming out of his ears, whose manufacturing plant out in the desert in Las Vegas has got a picture of a gray alien on the side of the building. He knows that we have technology that we're working on figuring out how to get people off of this planet and onto distant stars. That day is coming. And if that day is coming, then we're fools to think that God never wrote about it in his word. But I'm pretty sure he did. Now you have more to think about, okay? Now you're going to wait for part three, which may take me a little while to start putting it together. So you pray for me that I, we're in the process of, uh, I think painters are coming to our house tomorrow. So we're in the process of getting our house put back together again. I'm trying to work as hard as I can on this, doing recordings when I can. You pray for me. But pray that I don't lead you in the wrong direction with this, okay? That if I'm wrong, God will correct me. And if you think I'm wrong, you go to the book and study this book and say, God, show me the truth. I promise you he will. God bless you. You're the reason why we do what we do. Pray for our ministry. Pray for our work in Kenya. I believe that God is doing wonderful things with our ministries all around the world. Continue to pray for us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.